about that. I was cl sorry about that. I was cleaning my phone. Anyways, let's continue. What's this thing? Load? Monster segment. Someone somewhere's got to have this. Uh huh. I think I need to see it again to have some sort of closure. I've thought about this clip every day for the past thirty years. Be perfectly honest. I know. Get a life. I'm thirty-seven. <laughs> this I'm clip would have aired between 1976 and 1978. The way they read it, sounds like I know. Get a life. I'm 37. Sorry. <laughs> there were urban myths surrounding this clip. It had to be removed and destroyed because it was causing mental distress, etc. I don't believe that, but I do believe there's a reason why it seems to be the one Sesame Street clip that cannot be found, and why posts and links on various sites are removed once posted. Is this part of some CTW cover-up? What the hell is There's got to be a reason this has stuck so vividly in my brain for 30 plus years. I need to see it again and get it out. I need to stop this online crusade and do something more important. But until someone finds it for me, the search continues. Someone, please, put me out of my misery. Feel free to email me directly. John. That's a... Sure, grab me a gun. not many people had VCRs at the time of its alleged airing. And there were doubts that Sesame Street had archives of their older material. Still, Armin remained determined. He and Bourne began to converse. And soon, a few other anonymous members began to chime in about their experience with the crack monster. And it became more and more evident that this short truly does exist, with everyone's descriptions being so similar. While not much to go off of, a small task force was forming with the sole intent of finding this monster. This is good. Sorry, let's uh, check. Anonymous package? What the what? Okay, this is 19 minutes, that's fine. Sesame Street. In 2008, several clips of Sesame Street were being uploaded to YouTube, yet the crack master remained missing. John Armand decided to do something that he didn't think of doing at any time in the past 30 years for some reason. Contact Children's Television Workshop. You'd think that he would do that at some point, but whatever. After much thorough oh, searching, Armin finally manages to contact an anonymous source at CTW's archives. He learns that the segment first aired on Thursday, February 10th, 1977, during the first 15 minutes of the 979th episode of Sesame Street. Pretty specific information. Huh. Unfortunately, he was unable to get any further information, such as what studio or artist was involved in its creation, or when it stopped airing. Armin stated that, at this point, searching for the crack monster had become his life's work. However, he went a bit silent at this point. How? When suddenly, the most bizarre thing happened. Armin received a fax at work from an anonymous source. Fax? The fax simply stated, we have the copy. What copy? Not a copy of the short. The copy. There was also a bit more to this message. Dale sent him the copy of the clip on the condition that he never holds a public meeting or releases it online in any way. What? The clip was for him and him only. Hang on a second. Whoa, whoa. Armin faxes back confirmation that he agrees and learns that this fax number is untraceable. Wait, wait hey, hold the phone. That does... Six months pass by and suddenly... Armin finds a DVD in his mailbox. Alongside the disc was a note that said, We trust this completes your search. What's also weird is that it was delivered on a Sunday, the one day of the week that there's no mail delivery. That is true. Additionally, there was no return address on the package, nor any sort of call? stamp. Did he call police? Meaning that whoever sent him this disc did it personally. He better fucking call police. After popping in the disc... A Burton and Ernie segment played out before fading into the short that eluded him for three decades. The Crack Monster. Armin finally had it in his possession, but he couldn't show it to anyone. Well, that's what he said, but promises don't last long. He soon contacted Jennifer Bourne and asked to meet up with her at a coffee shop in Los Angeles. Uh. She was incredibly skeptical at first. You're crazy, I told myself, sitting alone in the coffee shop. This is ridiculous. It was 7.29 a.m. Sunday morning. It was here that John and I agreed to meet, so he could show me his copy of the so-called Crack Monster cartoon, a long-lost clip from Sesame Street that only aired a few times, yet managed to thoroughly freak out kids who saw it. Then John got a copy. 
At least that's what he said. He also said he was forbidden to post it. No video, no pictures, no sound. Why? The story of how he got it was strange, too. It Fellow is. The searchers got suspicious. Sure, he said he had it, but did he really have it? Months ago, he promised that he showed it to me the next time he was in town. Sure, I thought. A stranger is going out of his way to meet you and show you a cartoon. But, much to her surprise, he showed up with a bag containing the DVD. The crack monster had finally been found, but... Who made the shorts? Who sent it? And why weren't they allowed to show it to anyone? Yeah, that's the thing. Dallas, I, oh, yeah. The crack monster segment was both found and lost at the same time. Armin had it in his possession, but he couldn't share it, so... Now what? Well, after hearing about what went down, Lost Media Wiki founder Dykate decided to try and figure out the truth of the crack monster himself, or rather the crack master, as Armin was able to confirm that was the official name. Dykate reaches out directly to Armin and Born, and learns of the stipulation that they are not allowed to release the footage, at least until Armin completes a documentary he was working on about the search. This was incredibly confusing to Dykate, as Armin had signed a contract stating he would never release it. He did send out audio of the documentary to a select few, but there were no visuals whatsoever. Daike decided to investigate some of the rumors surrounding the shorts to get a better idea of what's going on here. One of these rumors was that it was animated by Cosmo Anzalotti, an animator with dozens of credits to his name, such as the Smurfs, He-Man, and Alvin and the Chipmunks. He-Man. However, after reaching out to him, Anzalotti responded with this letter. Thank you for your letter. And thank you for your efforts and dedication to preserve some rare and obscure animation history. A very noble endeavor. Huh. I'm sorry, but during my time in the animation industry, I just can't recall this particular film, Crack Master. It's possible I may have worked on it, and it's also possible that credit was mistakenly given to me. I just don't have any memory of it. Sorry. I commend you for gathering all those signatures. I just wish I could have been more help. Good luck and best wishes to you and your work. So yeah, a dead end. But he got a pretty bitchin' drawing of Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. At this point, Daike begins to question the yeah, validity cool. of Armin's DVD. I know, it's incredibly weird that he is apparently not allowed to share it, but can when his documentary is released. It's very fishy and makes no sense. Especially since he signed a contract to not release it at all. And it wasn't Sesame Workshop that said they stored little video footage. It was the CTW archives held at the University of Maryland. Even weirder was an email exchange I had with the head of the Sesame Workshop's PR department, who told me, Sorry, we will not be able to release the segment at all. Thank you for understanding. When I asked about why this was so, she simply never replied. What the hell? The little hell. Then suddenly, as it happened to Armin, Daike also received an anonymous message in the form of an email with a temporary address. The email contained a video file of cracks, this time including a title card and omitting the Burton Ernie section, as if it was a separate file. However, unlike Armin's message, there was zero text aside from the video, no rule stating that it can't be shown online. There was nothing, just the video. Ah. Daike didn't hesitate. He uploaded the video online. Yeah, we get to see the cracks. Oh, it's animated the While same way. In her bed, the cracks overhead more and more looked like a camel. Today's a rainy day and I can't go out and play. Would you take me for a ride, camel? Said the camel crack, climb upon my back, and right through the wall they did go. Okay, not that bad so far. <laughs> they fly. Hello to you, Miss Hen. Meet my friend. Then went the three to wall where Crack Monkey lived, close by the attic door. Good day, good day, good day. I'm glad you came my way. And how has everybody been? We've all been fine. Meet a new friend. Fun fact, I was actually thinking about doing this, so thank you, Blind on George. And this is all of you? Yes, now that you're here, too. But perhaps not so, said Monkey Crack. At night behind the door, I think I've heard one more. Then let us all go make a new crack friend. So they happily skipped into where they'd never been and in corner found a giant crack. 
Ooh, creepy. This is not that creepy. Whoa, okay. <laughs> Not that bad. Okay, not that bad. But that's the CO sixty four. Despite the crackmaster being found, there were still so many unanswered questions. Exactly. Who made this? Where did it come from? And who sent it? While some were satisfied at this point, Kurt Anderson from the Studio Three Sixty podcast decided to investigate further and answered some of those lingering questions. Now, having seen Cracks as a child, his fascination was more with the story behind it rather than the short itself. He manages to get in contact with and visits Ben Lehman, the executive producer for Sesame Street for the past 17 years. Anderson discovers that their copy of Cracks isn't in the Sesame Street building. It, alongside many of the older tapes, are in an external storage facility in Queens. However, it was digitized, and lo and behold, it was found in their online databases. Now, given that any employee at Sesame Workshop could have easily accessed the short, it might have been somebody from the company that leaked the copy to John Arman. Ben Lehman had no idea who could have leaked it, but he did have some theories as to why the short was pretty much abandoned and disowned by Sesame Street. The main reason being its title, Duh. <laughs> How about six years later, the war on drugs began, and crack became slang for drugs. The producers most likely didn't want their child-friendly series to be associated with drugs in any way, which is pretty interesting given that now Sesame Street has a moment that teaches children about drug addiction and substance abuse. Uh. But whatever. Another theory that Lehman had was that, given the recession occurring at the time, many homes and apartments weren't in the best shape. So to have a cartoon about a broken home with cracked walls could have been seen as a little insensitive. Lehman provided a lot of great information, but he had one more really interesting thing to share. He discovered that the short was created by P Imagination, a studio that he had never heard of, nor yielded any results when searching through Google. However, there was a studio called Imagination Inc. in San Francisco, ran by a man named Jeff Hale, that was involved in some Sesame Street projects. Unfortunately, the studio shut down in 1979, and Anderson was unable to speak to anybody. Uh -huh. Luckily, an employee from Sesame Workshop came through for Anderson and found the people involved with the music for Cracks, including a mysterious woman named Dorothy Moskowitz. Hmm. This person. Hmm. Do I agree Anderson it. was able to find this mysterious woman through Facebook, and after a few messages back and forth, she agreed to speak with him on the phone. Listen closely. She might sound familiar. Hi there. I need to lower the volume now. Hold on a second. Recognize your voice? No. Well, this might help. While the young in her bed, the cracks overhead. Look more and more like a camel. <laughs> I wish I could do it over. Oh. She voiced the crack master and had no idea that people were looking for this thing for the past 40 years. She literally found out the day before Anderson called her. I just found out about it yesterday, so it, it hasn't settled quite, but I was amazed that there's this underground upset and just a lot of, what can I call it, a cult, you know? Cult, Alongside yeah, Alongside right. being the voice for the Crackmaster, Moskowitz was also the lead singer in the band The United States of America in the 1960s, mm. being known as one of the most influential bands of the decade. She would enjoy working solo gig after solo gig, eventually leading her to a studio gig for what would become Cracks. What's odd is that she described it as one of the strangest recording sessions she's ever attended. There was no melody for her to follow, no chords set up, and she was basically told to improvise. For the Crackmaster, she was instructed to really get into it and chew the scenery, which was very cathartic to her. To this day, Moskowitz has no idea who wrote or animated the shorts.
but she did remember one other person who attended the recording session, a mysterious woman dressed in white. She arrived late and was dressed head to toe in white linens, described like a living blouse. She couldn't remember the woman's name, aside from it being vaguely hippie-ish, like sky or earth. Moskowitz believes that she may have been the graphic artist for Cox, but no one knows for sure. As the story of Cracks comes to an end, for now at least, we may never know who created the shorts, who sent it to John Armin, and why it was kept hidden the way it was. But, in some ways, it kind of adds to its legacy. One has to wonder, though, how could a shorts on a series as popular as Sesame Street have this much mystery surrounding it? I think I'm going to join some of these chat groups and try and figure out what's what, because I was as close to it as you could possibly be, and I'm still mystified. Yeah, and with that being said, I, I'm going to be honest, I really don't know what to say about that. Other than, hey, the short's been found. Yeah, the short's been found. Definitely been questionable. Oh well, at least the good news is it wasn't that scary. Like I said, it wasn't that bad. Obviously, looking back at it now, because we can show much more scarier things. Um, but, anyways, I definitely agree why it may have been lost and also all that. It's just that, why would, it definitely had a lot of mystery to it. Like, my only true advice is, if someone tells you, even though it might be the real thing and you don't want if someone tells you not to post it, please doesn't let local law enforcement get involved, because that sounds so suspicious. Anyways, that was the bizarre search for cracks in the wall, not drugs. This has go ahead and go to Blame on Chores and check out his other videos. I highly recommend he does top somethings and recently been doing like this documents. And I really recommend. So you don't have to describe to me, but do describe subscribe to him and i guess i'll see you guys later this has been flash snapping out